In this video is a selection of films made about Gateshead from 1925 to 1972. The first film in the collection shows the building of the new Tyne Bridge between August 1925 and October 1928, one of the biggest and costliest civil engineering projects in the northeast in the early part of this century. The bridge was designed by Mott, Hay and Anderson and built by Dorman Long of Middlesbrough. The architectural treatment was by R. Burns Dick, although regrettably the massive triumphal arches which he designed for both approaches to the bridge were not built. It's often believed that the Tyne Bridge was the model for the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which is about three times its size, but the Sydney Bridge was in fact designed first. Construction of the bridge began with the sinking of the concrete supports for the abutments and hinges of the arch the workmen digging steadily downwards under compressed air until bedrock was reached at 80 to 90 feet. In 1924, Gateshead was linked to Newcastle by four bridges. The Swing Bridge had in 1876 replaced the Old Tyne Bridge, versions of which had existed since Roman times. It crossed the Tyne at a low level. The coming of the railways in the 1830s and 1840s had required a new bridge linking the two towns while avoiding the steep declivities of the River Gorge. This became the High Level Bridge, opened for rail in 1849 and for road in 1850. Next came the Redhuth Bridge to the west, opened for road traffic in June 1871. The quartet was completed in July 1906 by the King Edward Bridge for rail only. At the same time as the bridge supports were being built, buildings were demolished for the bridge approaches. In Gateshead, the east side of Bottle Bank and the west side of Church Street were cleared, as well as part of St Mary's Churchyard and Bridge Street. This part of Gateshead was the location of many cheap lodging houses. No record seems to have been kept of where the displaced people were moved. The road deck was built on each side of the river in 40-foot lengths and hauled by hand winches towards the site of the abutment towers, the deck being added to as it moved forward. A light railway on the deck was used to carry materials. Because the Tyne Improvement Commissioners refused to allow the river to be obstructed in any way while the bridge was being built, so the normal practice of using staging and of lifting material from barges in the river was ruled out. The arch was constructed from both banks simultaneously, each half being supported by temporary cables. Cranes on the bridge structure lifted the steelwork into place. As the half arches moved towards each other, the supports for the road deck were slung from them. As the arch gradually takes shape, with the steel erectors moving confidently around the structure, the reasoning behind the new bridge needs to be considered. 
users of the high level and red hue bridges were subject to tolls, leaving the swing bridge as the only link between the two towns, which was free both for pedestrians and road traffic. Its disadvantages were that it obliged its users to descend via Bottle Bank or Church Street almost to river level, only to have to climb the equally steep Dean Street or Akenside Hill to reach the centre of Newcastle, and that it was then frequently opening for ships to pass up or down river. Nevertheless, many people thought it worthwhile to use it to avoid the tolls on the other bridges. The movement towards a further bridge across the Tyne began in 1893, when a joint committee of Gateshead and Newcastle councils was set up to report on the feasibility of a new bridge from High Street in Gateshead to Pilgrim Street in Newcastle. Proposals were abandoned, mainly for reasons of cost, and it was not until 1922 that the matter was seriously raised again. In that year, a joint town planning committee proposed three new Tyne crossings at Scotswood, Bill Quay, and near the existing high-level bridge. This last had been strengthened in 1921 and 22 to carry trams between Gateshead and Newcastle, and it consequently became even more congested. Increasing motor traffic meant that cars and lorries were now competing with slower horse-drawn vehicles. By 1923, Pressure for action increased on the local authorities in Gateshead and Newcastle from such disparate sources as the Chamber of Commerce and deputations from the unemployed. In January and February 1924, both councils agreed to proceed with the new bridge, and this decision was endorsed by public meetings. The only major objection came from the London and North Eastern Railway which had been making £22,000 a year in high-level bridge tolls from the tramway companies alone. The necessary Act of Parliament received the Royal Assent in 1924. When the arch was finally closed, maroons were detonated and flags unfurled. The completed bridge has a span of 531 feet, when built the largest arch in the country and the road deck is 84 feet above high water, with a rise from the support pin centres of 170 feet. The weight of mild steel in the arch is 4,000 tonnes, with a further 4,000 tonnes in the abutment towers and approach structure. Total cost of the bridge was about £1,200,000, of which 60% was contributed by the Ministry of Transport. The bridge was painted green with a specially developed paint manufactured by J. Dabney and Company of Gateshead. As parties of officials inspect the structure, the 56-foot wide road deck was being laid, then of wood block paving on concrete. In the background can be seen the Newcastle Electricity Supply Company's recently completed Carlyle House and the Salvation Army Men's Palace on City Road. The new Tyne Bridge was officially opened by King George V on the morning of the 10th of October 1928. At the specially constructed dais, the Lord Lieutenant of County Durham, Lord Londonderry, presented the Mayor and Mayoress of Gateshead and other local notables. Prayers were said by the Bishops of Durham and Newcastle. The King's speech concluded, It is my earnest hope that this notable improvement may help to bring back the full tide of prosperity which your courage and patience under recent difficulties so richly deserves. He turned a key which raised a barrier in the center of the bridge. At that moment, flags were unfurled, a 21-gun salute was fired from the gate's head side of the river by the 21st Field Brigade Royal Artillery, church bells rang, and ships in the Tyne sounded their sirens. Amid this din, the royal party crossed into Gateshead for further engagements, while crowds milled around inspecting the new bridge. The last sequence of this film, photographed from the Gateshead approach immediately after opening, shows the Tyne Bridge in use by a wide variety of traffic, including northern buses. The bridge provided a second tramway link between Gateshead and Newcastle until 1950. 
Although now a victim of the traffic congestion it was built to relieve, it remains an internationally recognized symbol of Tyneside. The royal visit of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth to Gateshead on the 22nd of February 1939 was the second day of a three-day visit to North East England. The party arrived in the royal train at Gateshead West Station at 9.45 under grey skies on a bitterly cold day. Just after 10 o'clock, the royal party arrived via West Street and Durham Road at Gateshead Children's Hospital in Dryden Road. The Children's Hospital had been founded as a charity in 1885. On the 15th of October 1888, the original building was opened with eight beds for children aged from 3 to 12, staffed by a matron and three nurses. A new wing opened in 1908, and further extensions were added in 1922. At the time of the royal visit, there were about 45 beds. It was then the only hospital in the town, apart from that at High Teams Institution, the former workhouse at Bensham. The royal visitors were guided round the hospital by the chairman of the committee, Hugh Watson, and the matron, Marion Dawson. The queen, wearing a sage green costume and a green hat with ostrich plume, talked to some of the patients and their nurses. Several of the children naturally seem apprehensive. Among them were Joyce Williams and Rosie Lee, both aged nine, Rose Miller, 13, and 11-year-old John Newton, who'd been in the hospital for three years with a spinal injury. Leaving the hospital, the royal party then visited a house on the Victoria Road housing estate, which regrettably was not filmed. The main purpose of the royal visit was to declare open the 700-acre Team Valley Trading Estate, the first such estate in the northeast, construction of which had begun in August 1936. The King and Queen were guided through their three-hour visit to the Team Valley by Colonel K.C. Appleyard, Chairman of Northeastern Trading Estates Limited. After the official opening, the film of which has been edited to avoid showing the fact that the ornate bow of the ribbon would not untie and had to be cut with scissors, there was lunch and visits to factories, including John Barron, the clothing manufacturer. The estate was sponsored by the government to the extent of £2 million and was an attempt to alleviate the shocking levels of unemployment and distress in the North East. The idea of smaller factories grouped together on a fully serviced site would, it was hoped, reduce the area's dependence on the declining traditional industries. The estate was designed by W.G. Holford. The main road through the site, Kingsway, was then at 147 feet, the widest road in England. The first firm to rent a factory on the estate was the food manufacturer Havemore Limited. In September 1936, the lettings continued steadily until the official opening. By the outbreak of war, seven months later, about 5,000 people were employed there. Saltwell Park was one of Gateshead's greatest assets. It was one of the few amenities in the borough that people travelled from outside the town to visit. Most of the original Saltwell Park was the private grounds of Saltwell Towers, a Victorian mansion built for the stained glass manufacturer William Wales. The corporation bought Wales's land for £32,000 in 1876 and spent a further £11,000 on landscaping the northern half which until then had been open fields. A 14 and a half acre lake was formed in 1880 with an island. In the summer of 1944, 
Saltwell Park was the main venue in Gateshead for Holidays at Home. The first part of the film shows the great variety of events which took place in the park that wartime June over 50 years ago. People seemed content with these simple and harmless pleasures. For the children, there was boating on the lake, pony riding, people had been asked to lend their ponies, punch and judy, and foot races of all kinds. The mayor, Sidney Heppel, and the mayoress took a full part and awarded modest prizes to the children. For adults, one of the main events was a bowls tournament for a cup presented by the town's Member of Parliament, Thomas Magnay. The fairground showman, J.G. Gray, paid £300 for the privilege of operating his roundabout and other rides, but was forbidden to use a game called Roll Them In, presumably because it was a game of chance. In 1944, the periods fixed for the holidays at home were the 17th to the 25th of June and the 5th to the 8th of August. The council allocated £1,000 for the events and asked its employees to assist voluntarily. Saltwell Park closed at 11 p.m. for the period. Since 1942, the government had devoted a great deal of effort to persuading people of the virtues of holidays at home. The idea was to discourage people from travelling to the seaside or to other parts of the country, thus putting a burden on an already overstretched railway system. In a well-known slogan of the time, people were asked to consider, is my journey really necessary? Special holiday trains were in fact withdrawn. Some historians believe that most people ignored the government's exhortations, and while the Gateshead holidays at home were undoubtedly popular, it's likely that many could not afford to go away on holiday anyway. The government devolved the task of organising holidays at home to local authorities, and Gateshead Corporation sponsored them in the summers of 1942, 43 and 44. So, by this last full summer of the Second World War, a great deal of experience had been gained at making much out of little. One unusual aspect of the 1944 holidays was the decision to make a film of the events in superb quality colour, producing a unique record of Britain in wartime. The cameraman is thought to have been a member of the police force. Much of each afternoon was taken up with more or less organised children's sports, sack races, skipping races and the like. Modest prizes, probably pennies, were awarded to winners. Parents were also enthusiastically involved. This netball match was between teams from the National Fire Service F Division and the ATS, the Army's Auxiliary Territorial Service. The Fire Service won by a convincing 30 to 6. The losers smile bravely for the camera. Towards evening, there was dancing on the green in Saltwell Park. Couples attempted to perform versions of ballroom dancing and barn dancing on the difficult surface. The absence of men of military age is very noticeable. The Allied invasion of the European continent had taken place only a fortnight before. Though some American GIs are present, as is the latest dance sensation, the jitterbug.
carefully rehearsed classes of girls from the town schools performed folk dances, and boys and girls demonstrated what was then known as drill. While fascinated children watched the traditional Punch and Judy show in the park, many other holidays at home events were taking place throughout the borough. At the Shipley Art Gallery, there were exhibitions of Soviet art in wartime and Czechoslovak physical training, which the local press described as interesting. Band concerts by colliery and brass bands were entertaining crowds at other parks in the town. At the Shipcoat Baths was a water polo match between Gateshead and South Shields. Not all events took place in the open air. The new ship coat baths were also used for swimming and diving displays, and on this occasion for a bathing beauty competition. The public libraries also hosted holidays at home events, in addition to providing more popular novels. The last of the holidays at home was on August Bank Holiday 1944. On this occasion, the cameraman recorded the activities later into the evening, as the shadows lengthened on the grass of Saltwell Park. As dusk fell, dancing took over, both for children and adults. By August, many people thought that the war would be over by Christmas, and were trying to get back to a normal routine. The events in the park were losing their appeal. Many more servicemen and women are home on leave than in the earlier film. Trains to holiday resorts were crowded, and at bus stations, queues of four hours waited for transport to the Northumbrian countryside. The very enthusiastic uniformed dance orchestra is, unfortunately, unidentified. VE, or Victory in Europe Day, was celebrated on the 8th of May, 1945. Again, Gateshead filmed the events in colour, beginning with ships tied up at Newcastle and Gateshead Quayside, with flags and bunting flying in celebration. Residents of many streets in the town got together to organize street parties, just as they'd done at the end of the First World War. It's difficult now to identify the streets which were filmed, but most were in the teams area. As the local paper put it, many of the poorer streets were the most generously decorated with festoons of flags strung across. Happy faces greet the camera, the people waving and making the Churchillian V sign, although the white dog was unconcerned. Not only did the wartime privation seem to be at an end, although the war was far from over for those who had relatives fighting in the Far East, but people felt that they could look forward to a better future. 
In addition to the street parties, Gateshead marked the day with special church services, a broadcast of the King's Speech in Saltwell Park, and a huge bonfire at Moss Heap Quarry's Sheriff Hill. The newspapers also reported that in High Street, soldiers and sailors linked six abreast with their girlfriends and danced along the roadway singing Me and My Girl. In Saltwell Park on the following day, the 9th, there was music in the afternoon and dancing on the green from 8.30 until 10.30. The following Sunday, the 14th of May, 1945, was Thanksgiving Day. In Gateshead, this began with a parade to Saltwell Park by representatives of all those units, civilian as well as military, which had played a part in the war. This was followed by an open-air service of thanksgiving in the park, at which the rector of Gateshead, Canon Hugh Stevenson, the mayor, Thomas Ryan, and the town clerk, J.W. Porter, took part. For a Tyneside town, Gateshead, in contrast to North and South Shields, had been relatively unaffected by the air war despite the fact that many factories in Central Gateshead and at the Team Valley Trading Estate to the west of the town were engaged in war work. Only five people were killed in the town as a result of enemy bombing. The largest stick of bombs fell inside Saltwell Park, causing little damage. The local Home Guard, formed in May 1940 as the local defence volunteers, had been disbanded late in 1944. Since the mid-1970s, Gateshead has gained an international reputation as a promoter of sport, particularly of athletics. Twenty years earlier, in the mid-1950s, sport had a somewhat lower profile, with the major athletics events in the town being the sports in the youth stadium, later massively developed as Gateshead International Stadium, and the annual Clark Chapman Sports, held on the company's own field at Old Fold, adjacent to their works. When this film was made, Clark Chapman was one of Gateshead's major employers, having, unlike many engineering companies, survived the various trade depressions from the 1890s to the 1930s. The firm was founded at South Shore Gateshead in 1864 by William Clark, an engineer formerly with the Bedlington Ironworks and Armstrongs of Ellswick. In 1874, the company acquired 14 acres of land off St. James's Road for new works and soon added a further 14 acres to it. At about this time, Captain William Chapman became a partner in the firm. They manufactured ships' winches and by 1868 had constructed the first steam-driven cargo winch to appear on the market. By the end of the century, the company had diversified into boiler feed pumps boilers, electricity generating plants for ships, and electric deck winches. In 1907, there were over 2,000 employees, with welfare societies, sports and social clubs, and a choral society. In the mid-1950s, the company was still independent, manufacturing marine auxiliary equipment. Mergers were to follow from the 1960s. The works which can be seen in the background to these scenes was demolished in 1995. An earlier period in Gateshead's history in which its sportsmen were nationally renowned was the mid-19th century, when the town produced national champions in athletics. Foot racing, known as pedestrianism, was revived in 1855 by James Rowan, born in Oakwell Gate in 1836. He travelled to Manchester, London and Scotland to compete in professional road and track races. He defeated international competition in the form of Jackson, the American deer, before high living caused his early death in 1864, the year in which William Clark established his company. John White of Gateshead succeeded Rowan as champion in 1859. The last great foot runner of this period was Stephen Ridley, who defeated a Manchester runner to win the mile championship at Fires Goose Running Grounds in 1872. Athletics, both professional and amateur, continued, the former at a running ground near Clark Chapman's called Borough Gardens. Here, additional attractions were rabbit coursing and quoits. 
it was to counter the professionalism and gambling at this venue that amateur sports clubs were founded, the first of which was North Durham Cricket Club, established in 1864, which quickly became the amateur sporting centre for the town. Attractions here, in addition to cricket and rugby football, were foot racing, pole vaulting and bicycle racing. Road racing was encouraged by the formation of Harriers clubs, often connected with local churches. It's this amateur tradition which has continued into the present. This film of the royal visit of Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh to Gateshead on Friday the 29th of June 1954. This was a rather hurried affair, following on from a morning spent in Tynemouth, Wall's End and Newcastle. The royal party drove across the Tyne Bridge into Gateshead, where the Lord Lieutenant of County Durham, Lord Lawson of Beamish, introduced the Mayor of Gateshead, Alderman Benny Young, the Town Clerk, C.D. Jackson and other local dignitaries. The party then moved to a specially constructed dais, which was supposed to have had a canvas roof. Unfortunately, the morning's high winds had blown this over the bridge parapet into the car park in Church Street. The bouquet was presented by six-year-old Muriel Hall, a pupil at Oakfield Nursery School. Every vantage point was crowded for the event. Some even ventured onto the roof of St Mary's Church, the ceremony on the bridge lasted only four minutes. With the royal party then leaving the bridge past the Half Moon Hotel and under the railway bridge into High Street where a part of the day's massive crowds can be seen. Meanwhile, on the Tyne Bridge, the crowds dispersed and the Guard of Honour, formed by men of the 9th Durham Light Infantry Territorial Army, marched away. The 9th Battalion and its predecessors had been associated with Gateshead for almost a century. Exercise Time was a big civil defence operation which took place on the Gateshead and Newcastle Quaysides on Sunday the 15th of June 1952. In the early years of the Cold War, civil defence had a high profile. The Newcastle and Gateshead Joint Fire Service was the backbone of the number one northern civil defence region. This exercise was modelled on similar operations which had taken place in Southampton and Liverpool. Altogether, 500 firemen from Northumberland, Durham, Cumberland, Westmoreland and the North Riding of Yorkshire took part. The main Gateshead fire station was then in Swinburne Place, from which units can be seen emerging. The last driver only just manages the sharp turn into Swinburne Street. The purpose of the exercise was to simulate the effects of high explosive and incendiary bombing. Parties worked from the top of the recently completed Ranks flour mill and from Kent House in Church Street. Most communication between participating units was by radio, with messages being sent by walkie-talkie from the flour mill to the fire station in Pilgrim Street, Newcastle, although dispatch riders were also used. Exercise Time was filmed for the Newcastle and Gateshead Joint Fire Service, which had been formed in 1948, after the two brigades, along with the Auxiliary Fire Service, had worked together under government control during the war. At one stage, about 180 water jets from 64 fire appliances were in action simultaneously.
as well as the full-time fire service personnel also taking part with the Auxiliary Fire Service and the Civil Defence Corps. Members of the faking group of the Whitley Bay St John's Ambulance Brigade played the part of casualties. Gateshead Women's Voluntary Service provided tea and refreshments. The event naturally attracted crowds of excited children. The fireboat, which is seen making a patriotic display at the end of the sequence, was mainly paid for by the government from its civil defence budget. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, the physical appearance of Gateshead began to change, from what was still by and large a town which reflected its greatest period of growth in the late 19th century, to a more modern image. This transition is symbolised by this short film, most of which was shot in Gateshead, of the last few remaining gas street lamps on Tyneside, each of which had to be individually lit by hand. Electric street lighting had been gradually replacing gas since the 1930s. The Gateshead scenes show the area around the Windmill Hills. In 1972, the last gas lamps were phased out, many to be sold by the Northern Gas Board as garden ornaments. And the lamplighter, with his ladder, was no longer to be seen in the streets of Gateshead. The final film in this collection was made in the years between 1969 and 1971, and shows even more powerfully the great changes to the central area of the town in this period. It was issued to mark the completion and opening of the Gateshead Viaduct in September 1971. Just as the Tyne Bridge had been built to relieve traffic congestion at the Tyne Crossing in the 1920s, this new scheme was intended to relieve a bottleneck which in the intervening 40 years had moved 100 yards south into Gateshead Town Centre. In 1960, the Felling Bypass had opened to relieve traffic on Sunderland Road, and in 1966, a traffic management scheme for Central Gateshead attempted to deal with the problem. All traffic from the east, the west and the south came together at the junction of High Street, Jackson Street and Park Lane, before proceeding north towards the Tyne Bridge, making this area particularly hazardous for pedestrians. The solution adopted was to build the Gateshead Viaduct, also planned in 1966. Construction began in March 1969, following a route which had been reserved for the A1 since before the war. The surface road, which had been planned at that time, had now become, due to the increase in traffic, a massive 3,000 foot long, two lane dual carriageway on each of two levels. The ground level roads to serve local traffic and the elevated level to be used by through traffic. To considerable local embarrassment, it was found that the dual level road made six blocks of three-storey maisonettes on the Chandler's estate uninhabitable due to sound pollution. And they had to be demolished in 1972, having been completed only ten years earlier. Their tenants had already left, having demanded to be rehoused because of the noise and dust from construction. The approximate cost of the new viaduct was £3.8 million. The opening brochure for the scheme stated, With the advent of this new highway, the environment in the shopping and commercial centre of Gateshead should be considerably improved, due to the exclusion of heavy transport, with its attendant noise and pollution from exhaust fumes. Public transport will once again be using town centre roads without competing for space with large vehicles and two-way operation of roads will help the servicing and access to the numerous business premises, thus improving the commercial potential of the town. Ironically, the Western Bypass, which opened only a few years after the completion of the viaduct, 
took most of the through traffic out of the town altogether. We hope you've enjoyed this video, which has been compiled from original films in the care of Time and Weir Archives and Gateshead Library and Arts Department. In it, we've tried to show something of the changes to the appearance of the town and to the lives of its people over the last 60 years.